stalwart and noble souls, students all. Uh, I'm Barbara Wall from the Office of Mission and Ministry, and I welcome you to this lecture this, this evening, which is part of a, a year-long series on the Catholic tradition and peace tradition. Catholic peace tradition. So um, without much ado, I would I'd like to introduce um, one of our campus ministers, associate campus minister, Janet Cooper, who's going to introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon, and uh, uh, let me uh, thank Barbara for the invitation, and Jenna for her very kind uh, introduction, uh, and thank you uh, for showing up for a lecture on 
Thanksgiving week. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure my BC students will be there when I get home tonight for tomorrow's class, but you're here, so I'm, I, uh, I'm impressed by Villanova's devotion to the study of truth. This is uh, impressive. Uh, the title for my talk is uh, Papal Thoughts on Peace Since Vatican II. And uh, what I would like to do is uh, simply touch upon how Vatican II began to talk about the reality of peace and then how that idea has further developed in the tradition through contributions made by Paul VI and John Paul II. And then I want to close my remarks by making some comments about how we might think about uh, the Catholic understanding of peace and its relationship to the question of armed force in our world today. All you have to do is uh, watch the news today about the situation in uh, Gaza to realize that we live in a world that uh, desperately needs deeds of peace. Uh, and yet, despite the fact that we desperately need deeds of peace, there still remains a need for words of peace. Uh, first, we have to be able to articulate a vision of peace that is sufficiently inspiring so as to motivate people to do the hard work of building peace. We also require a vision of peace that is adequately clear so that it provides some direction for our efforts. And finally, if peace is truly a cooperative effort, and an attainment, the attainment of which is difficult to bring about, then we need a suitable description of peace in order to unify our efforts and direct our deeds to a common goal. Wise words can inspire great deeds. That is the contribution that the Catholic bishops at Vatican II in the pastoral constitution on the church and the modern world gave to the church and to all people of goodwill who seek peace. And what I'd like to do today, again, is to simply touch upon the teaching of Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution, and then discuss how Paul VI and John Paul II refined and shaped that vision of peace for our time. Now, one difficulty that can arise immediately when we talk about a vision for peace is that it can be so idealized, so placed into a distant future in such a transformed world that it does not really correspond with the earthly realities of life in our time. Words of peace need to inspire deeds, but those words must be adequate to guide our deeds. Too often, we can present a vision of peace that is wondrous to behold, but impractical to build, or at least lacks the specificity we need to provide us with political and moral guidance. It is my belief that Roman Catholic teaching provides a helpful way of understanding the meaning of peace. The teaching is helpful because it offers both inspiration and guidance to good-willed people interested in building a more peaceful world. And so I want to begin by clarifying the meaning of peace in Catholic teaching, then distinguishing the different kinds of peace in Catholic thought, and then analyzing the nature of one particular form of peace, what I will call political peace. And then I will end with some remarks about how one relates political peace to the issue of armed force. So first, the meanings of peace in the tradition. One of the ways to distinguish different meanings of peace is to consider the various terms used in the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Latin. The Hebrew word shalom implies a sense of well-being, of fulfillment, even material prosperity for the Israelite. To experience shalom is to know the fullness of life. The Greek word, irene, 
was derived from a root that meant linkage or order. Peace had connections with coherence, order, a coming together. The Latin word pax comes from the same root as the English word pact. Peace was an agreement for the Romans, a treaty not to fight. So already in the ancient world then, there's a basic distinction between peace as a negative term, the absence of war, versus peace as a positive state, the existence of a harmonious order or a way of being that led to full life. When clarifying the idea of peace then, one of the clearest lessons from the Jewish and Christian traditions is that peace is not merely the absence of war. And yet this way of thinking about peace is perhaps the most common in the American public mind. Whenever a war ends, the shooting stops, and a treaty between warring parties is signed, we say that peace has been restored. The end of hostilities is widely considered as the onset of peace. Such an approach treats peace as a sort of residual concept. It is what remains once parties cease shooting at one another. This is peace understood as non-war. But alternatively, alternatively, peace can be understood as a positive concept. When it stands for a particular value or a particular state of affairs that we, can that we can see equivalently as peace. Now the candidates for such equivalence to peace are harmony, personal and communal well-being, forgiveness and reconciliation, happiness, acceptance, security. Now, although this approach to peace is closer to the Catholic tradition's understanding, it has a significant drawback. If peace is simply to be understood as the equivalent of any and all good things, it is difficult to know what it means to create peace or when we will succeed in doing so if it simply means anything nice is peace. As already noted, the Catholic tradition, building on the biblical witness, sees peace as more than the absence of war. It is a positive ideal, but it's one that requires greater clarity because peace may refer to different, even if related, realms of experience. And in each of these realms, peace has been given a particular nuance. It is possible to describe at least three important realms in which the ideal of peace is central to Catholic thinking. When the biblical authors speak of peace, they are speaking of something positive, and an idea, it's an idea that includes but encompasses far more than politics. In one sense, peace has to do with being in covenant with God knowing and dwelling within God's merciful and faithful love. To be at peace with God is to dwell as one with God and all of God's creation in a harmonious, just, and loving community. This is the peaceful community of the prophet Isaiah, where the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. It is the peace of the new Jerusalem, the new creation, where the heavenly Jerusalem will descend as depicted in the book of Revelation. There will be no more tears or pain, no more suffering and death. This vision of peace can inspire and comfort us as we deal with life's troubles. It reminds us that God's power is greater than human evil and that one day God truly shall reign over all of creation. 
A second very common way of speaking about peace is evident in the letters of Paul and the Gospel of John. Here, peace is understood as an interior reality. It is an experience whereby one knows that one lives in the presence of Jesus as one's Lord. Peace in this sense stems from the realization that Christ has redeemed us, that our sins are truly forgiven by a loving God, that we are cherished and loved far beyond anything that we deserve. Interior peace flows from the gift of faith, that God in Jesus has turned his face upon us and that we are blessed to be in union with Christ. This peace is a result of the grace that, as Paul preaches, has come to all who are baptized in the Lord. It is the union of the vine and the branches that John describes. In sum, it is the peace that comes by communion with and by being part of the body of Christ. Now, it's hard to imagine Catholicism losing sight of these dimensions of peace and not being committed to preaching and teaching such a vision of peace. These are certainly more positive conceptions of peace than simply the idea of the absence of war. But what I'm go what I, in describing these, we might call them the eschatological or the future state of peace, as well as the interior state of peace. And while these are important and central to our tradition, they do not fully capture the peace that we need to talk about in our world today. There is at least one other dimension to peace, the political meaning of the term. And it is this understanding of peace that is the appropriate focus of Catholic social teaching. Throughout the Catholic tradition, there is a way of speaking about peace that can be distinguished from both peace as interior reality and peace as the fulfillment of creation beyond history. Besides these two meanings, there is also the peace of a rightly ordered political community. This is the kind of peace that Augustine described. And of course, as a visiting Franciscan on the campus of Villanova, I have to quote Augustine at least once uh, during this talk. But Augustine, in the City of God, describes peace as tranquillitas ordinis, an order of tranquility. It is the result of a political community that is rightly organized, meaning that people come to live in truth, in charity, in freedom, and justice, and that all their work is directed toward the common good. This is a peace that is within the grasp of human possibility. It is not just a distant goal for the end time, nor is it the interior experience that is achieved by knowing that Jesus is one's Lord. Rather, this is about constructing an exterior space through institutions and practices that permit men and women to live together if not as a Christian faith community, then at least as a properly human community. Peace in the political realm is a genuine kind of peace. And it's not to be disparaged because it is not the interior peace of Christian spirituality, nor is it the perfection of creation that is eschatological peace. Peace that is a rightly ordered political community is a noble thing to achieve, and it deserves our commitment to attain and preserve it. This sort of political peace, however, has its counterfeit and inadequate expressions as well. Political, that political peace can be counterfeit, con, excuse me, that political peace can be count, counterfeit, uh, counterfeit is seen in the prophet Ezekiel where the prophet reveals Yahweh's judgment upon the false prophets who mislead the pe people, saying, 
peace where there is no peace. Recall, too, the ancient historian Tacitus in his description of how the Britons bitterly described their Roman conquerors. They make a desert and they call it peace. There is, in short, a false peace that results from oppression and fear rather than justice and freedom. No violence, no bloodshed may be seen, but this is hardly a genuine peace, for it is based upon intimidation and control rather than right order. Another illustration might be a painful domestic setting, where a superficial peace may appear to be present in a family, but a violent spouse or parent strikes fear into others in the family who move warily, speak guardedly, and walk on eggshells for fear of inciting the angry parent. Both history and our present situation provide illustrations of peace that is unworthy of the name. At Vatican II, the bishops described another inadequate view of peace, what they called peace of a sort. And they, marked that, and they saw that as marking the situation of nuclear deterrence at the time of the mid-60s. This peace of a sort echoed the viewpoint of John the Twenty Third in his 1963 encyclical, Pacem in Terrace, Peace on Earth. John acknowledged that deterrence had seemingly contributed to a measure of international order and stability, even while it also maintained the constant threat of nuclear war. Without dismissing the argument of those who saw deterrence as a partial good, the Pope wrote, quote, the fundamental principle on which our present peace depends must be replaced by another, which declares that the true and solid peace of nations consists not in the equality of armaments, but in mutual trust. On the one hand, deterrence provided a peace of a sort, but on the other hand, it was not a satisfactory system of international order. It is the, the tug or the pull of the Christian future that calls humankind to move beyond the peace of a sort to a more genuine peace in the realm of politics. Here we see the impact of a particular understanding of Christian eschatology. The reign of God is not something that happens simply in the future, in the end time. Rather, the reign of God must be incarnated here and now, even if not in its fullness. An anticipatory understanding of the reign of God refuses to relegate the power of God's reign only to a distant future. Rather, the reign of God calls upon Christian disciples to transform their present in ways that demonstrate the here and now dimension of God's grace and power. So a true political peace is one that is subject to the power of God's reign that marks the complete and total transformation of God's good creation. The future peace of the end time influences the present by inspiring human beings to build a more adequate political order now, to not be satisfied with simply peace of a sort. True political peace must not be equated with anything less than a rightly ordered political community. A true political peace is founded not on fear or mistrust, but on the establishment of basic standards of human dignity, justice, and human rights. 
We can see then, when discussing peace within the political realm, there are three options. The risk of a counterfeit or false peace. The partial good of a weak peace or peace of a sort. And finally, a genuine political peace that establishes a rightly ordered political community, whether that is understood domestically or internationally. This last idea of peace is not equated with spiritual peace, nor is it the fullness of peace that will come at the end time. Yet it is open to the transformative power of that future peace. Such a political peace is a genuine good worthy of Christian support. Now, since the Second Vatican Council closed in 1965, there have been developments in Catholic social teaching that have further added to our understanding of peace. Recent teaching has stipulated two terms for peace when understood politically. Justice and development. At Vatican II, the bishops observed that peace is rightly and appropriately called an enterprise, a work of justice. A few years later, in a speech in 1972 celebrating the World Day of Peace, Paul VI coined the expression, if you want peace, work for justice. This formulation of Isaiah's vision became a slogan for many Catholic activists working in the field of social ministry. But it was a popular phrase with a rich heritage. Emphasizing a central place for justice in Catholic teaching on peace was consistent with the biblical tradition of shalom. The bishops at the council also wrote, peace is actualized by people as they thirst after ever greater justice. Two years later, Paul VI put it this way, Peace is something that is built up day after day in the pursuit of an order intended by God, which implies a more perfect form of justice among persons. In other words, peace in the political realm was not simply a blessing from God, but it was a task to be undertaken by human beings it could be actualized as people of goodwill work to create a more just world order. In Catholic teaching, the understanding of justice has been markedly shaped by the emergence of human rights language. Indeed, human rights have assumed, have assumed a pride of place in Catholic social teaching, such that the common good is redefined as the objective recognition, safeguarding, and promotion of the rights of the human person. Upholding the common good so defined is the goal of political authority. This might be called Catholic cosmopolis. That is, the view that in international affairs, the rights of persons take priority over the rights of states. This, in turn, explains why the Catholic vision of peace has accepted humanitarian interventions as sometimes necessary and appropriate. But more about that in a few moments. The second element of the teaching on peace, suggested since Vatican II, is the idea of development. The papal encyclical on the progress of peoples has as the subtitle of one of its sections, Development is the New Name for Peace. That subtitle highlighted the particular aspect of justice that required attention. During the decade of the 60s, there were competing theories of development as well as growing disenchantment with the word itself. As the residents of many poor nations found that their initial hopes for development following World War II were being dashed. Catholic social teaching began then to place modifiers in front of the word to, de 
development to distinguish the church's viewpoint from other perspectives that were deemed less adequate. Paul VI often used the expression integral development to express the conviction that development cannot be reduced merely to economic advancement. Other aspects of human existence, culture, politics, psychology, religion, these too had to be included in any satisfactory understanding of human development. What was especially important for Catholic social teaching was that any theory of development worthy of the name had to address the stubborn resistance of social structures that hindered the genuine advancement of people toward a better life. In Catholic social teaching, justice was seen as the key virtue needed when talking about the transformation of societies. Linking development and justice reveals the moral dimension of economic development. Economies can expand, but distribution of the benefits of such growth may be heavily skewed toward an elite in a society. True development must lead to widely shared participation in the benefits of economic progress. Justice entails the creation of a social system that promotes the common good and secures each person's right and ability to contribute to and to benefit from the common good. Now this way of thinking in modern Catholic social teaching led to the idea that both justice and development were terms for political peace. There can be no order of tranquility without justice. And the particular shape of justice needed in our time is just development. Only by promoting the well-being of the millions who are trapped in crushing poverty throughout the world can we attain a realistic hope of peace. Peace built on military or economic power may be peace of a sort, but it is not the Catholic understanding of political peace. For Catholic social teaching, the surer path to peace in our world is authentic and just development. There are three dimensions to this authentic development in Catholic social teaching. First, each and every person has the right to the means of their full development as persons. Secondly, authentic development consists of more than economic progress. And third, the affluent nations of the world have an obligation to share the benefits of development with the poorer nations. Development is an alternative to war in two senses. Or first, authentic development addresses many of the long-standing causes of war in our world. Second, the church hopes that a commitment to just development will prove to be what William James called the moral equivalent of war. That is, a noble cause that can be widely shared and for which people will make serious sacrifices. As this last point suggests, as the dimensions of the challenge of development on a global scale come into clearer focus, the significance of solidarity has also come to the forefront of Catholic social teaching on peace. Twenty years after Paul VI issued the encyclical on the progress of people, where he talked about development as the new name for justice, John Paul II wrote that solidarity is the path to peace and at the same time to development. For John Paul, solidarity is the virtue that allows us to see the other person, whether an individual, a people, or a nation, as our neighbor, as a helper, to be made a sharer 
on a par with ourselves in the banquet of life. It is that papal perspective on the other that encourages us to transform the fact of global interdependence into the moral commitment to work with and for others, especially the less fortunate. Solidarity, according to John Paul II, serves as the motivating energy that fosters the desire to work for truly just development, because it establishes proper national and international practices, proper national and international policies and institutions. It is from this work of solidarity in the pursuit of just development that true peace will emerge. As John Paul wrote, the goal of peace, so desired by everyone, will certainly be achieved through the putting into effect of social and international justice, but also through the practice of the virtues which favor togetherness and which help us to live in unity. Basically, this third component of peace, along with justice and development, is the Catholic vision that is solidarity along with justice and development. This solidarity is an active commitment to the belief that under God we truly belong to one family. Now to the annoyance of some Catholics, the tradition of Catholic social teaching is stubbornly internationalist in its outlook. The Church is strongly supportive of the United Nations, as well as other institutions and mechanisms that address problems on a global, not just national scale. So to sum up, the Catholic vision of peace embraces a committed engagement, solidarity, to the project of social progress for individuals and societies just development. Paul VI promoted this understanding by his linkage of development with justice as the new terms for peace. And John Paul, while echoing Paul's viewpoint, added solidarity as the crucial step in working for justice. Solidarity is the path to development, and peace is the end result of attaining a development that is just. A fourth and final element in the vision of peace that I have been sketching is that of international order and the role of armed force in that order. Because there can be no true peace without a political order that is just, there must be measures to correct injustices as a way to build peace. So for example, a society can institute mechanisms for adjudicating rival claims to settle disputes without recourse to violence. Thus, we have systems of public safety and law that protect each person's rights, punish those who violate the rights of others, and that develop measures to compensate the victims of injustice. Domestically, therefore, we expect rival parties in disputes to resolve their differences without recourse to violence. Internationally, however, the situation differs. While Catholic social teaching has often promoted and praised the work of those who strive to create a true international order, there is the acknowledgement that there is a structural flaw in our global system. No institution of international order plays the role that the state plays in our domestic society. There are movements of human rights, movements of international law, there are regional accords, and there are other building blocks of international order. But the analogy between domestic and international society still limps. In large part, that is due to the inability of any agent of international order to guarantee the rights of a nation state. 
This is the structural flaw of international politics, that a state ought not be denied the right or duty to defend itself against injustice. Because peace without justice is no true peace, and no international authority is adequate to the task of securing international justice, there is a reluctant willingness in Catholic teaching to permit recourse to armed force under certain considerations. Now, for those who define peace as merely the absence of war, the claim that a war is fought for the sake of peace seems to be inherently contradictory. But in Catholic social teaching, precisely because peace is not the absence of war, but the establishment of a just political order, it can be the case that a war may be fought for the sake of peace. Given the positive understanding of peace, however, one ought not expect that war can establish peace. Rather, all that armed force can do is remove obstacles to peace, to stop genocide, to repel aggression, to depose tyrants. There is a real sense in which it is true that one can win a war, remove an obstacle to true peace, and fail to win the peace. That is, fail to proceed to build a just political order that promotes the common good and protects the rights of individuals. Is this not exactly what we see going on in Iraq and Afghanistan today? In addition, Catholic social teaching places limits on what can be done in the name of justice and peace. To allow for some war under certain conditions does not mean all war is legitimate, nor all actions in war permissible. This is the backdrop to the ongoing debate, debates and developments within the just war tradition. Because in modern times, even a just war causes great harm, the church has increasingly looked to other, less harmful ways of building peace. As a result, strategies of nonviolent social change have been accorded a more prominent place in recent church teaching. Support for nonviolence has meant that just war analysis, though still utilized, has been downplayed in recent years. In principle, the church continues to admit a limited just use of armed force when nonviolence fails. In practice, however, it appears to regard resistance to aggression and support for some humanitarian interventions as the sole justifying cause for armed force. And even in those cases, there are multiple reservations about the use of arms. Before concluding my remarks, I just want to comment upon the Catholic practice of peacemaking as well as the theory of peace. Two structural changes brought about by Vatican II enhanced the Church's peacemaking efforts. First was the establishment of bishops' conferences as forums for bishops to consult and coordinate on matters of pastoral and social strategy. The pastoral letters and public statements of these Episcopal conferences are often catalysts for public debate or galvanizing public opinion beyond the church. A second change was the creation of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace as part of the Vatican Curia, that is the Vatican bureaucracy. This Council for Justice and Peace carries out research and organizes programs in areas like arms control, arms trade, the abolition of anti-personnel mines, debt relief for poor nations, and trade reform. At local levels, diocesan justice and peace commissions, or human rights commissions, are the church's agencies that deal up close with regional problems. Vatican diplomacy 
in the modern papacy has also evolved. As a result of what has been called John Paul's diplomacy of conscience, the defense of human rights gained priorities. Today, the church's agreement with states tend to focus first on human rights in general, and only last on the specific needs of the church. If one turns to the activity of individual bishops, one finds the Guatemalan bishops and the Filipino bishops active in promoting peaceful social change that is noteworthy. Individuals like the modded bishops Juan Gerardi of Guatemala or Oscar Romero of, El of San Salvador, Samuel Ruiz of Chiapas, Mexico, Michael Sabar of Jerusalem, Carlos Bello, the Nobel Laureate of East Timor, all of these have been prominent figures in promoting human rights for the poor and mediating disputes between conflicting parties. During the decade of the 90s, an estimated 40 plus bishops served as national conciliators in civil conflicts within their countries. Noteworthy here is that bishops who speak out on human rights issues and thereby are thrust into the role of spokespersons for their people often lack a trained cadre of people or institutions to assist them in their efforts. One of the key advances needed in the coming years is for the church to implement programs that provide training, staffing, and infrastructure on the front lines of peacemaking. Now in speaking so much about the hierarchy, about popes and bishops, I do not wish to leave you with the impression that it is the clerical establishment who are the main agents for peacemaking in the Catholic Church. As the Second Vatican Council made clear, the work of transforming the world belongs appropriately to laywomen and laymen. Bishops, alone or together, are sometimes forced into leadership roles, but this ought not be the norm. As Catholic social teaching spreads among and shapes the next generation of Catholics, one hopes it will, it will result in many more young Catholics studying peacemaking. As that occurs, we will recognize that Catholic teaching and practice on peacemaking is strong on peace building, but weak on conflict resolution. Techniques of active nonviolence and conflict resolution are areas where the Catholic vision can benefit from the history of other religious traditions, such as the Mennonites. Apparent in all this is that peace studies is a particularly apt way for a Catholic university to contribute to the mission of the church. Such studies must be multidisciplinary. There is a need not only for theology and philosophy, but also economics, political science, sociology, social work, international studies, law, business, psychology, anthropology, health sciences, and other academic disciplines that can contribute to the rounding out and implementation of the Catholic vision of peace. In the 50 years since the uh, Vatican II opened, there have been notable developments in Catholic teaching and practice regarding peace. I've simply tried to highlight a couple of them for you. First is the increased appreciation for the meaning of peace in different realms. Second is the deeper understanding of the meaning of political peace as more than the absence of war. Third. Due to the influence of a more biblically informed approach, there is a specification of political peace as being strongly linked to the goals of just development and the practical strategies of solidarity. Finally, while the use of armed force to remove obstacles to peace is not ruled out, there is much greater interest in exploring nonviolent methods as better suited to building political peace. Today, Catholicism has articulated a positive theology of peace. The shalom that will characterize the state of existence in the end time and the inner serenity that arises from spiritual union with God and Christ 
are both to be prized as central beliefs of our Catholic faith. But these do not exhaust the meaning of peace, for in its social teaching, the Church has also developed an understanding of peace that is appropriate for political life. This political peace is both possible to achieve and a real blessing once established. It has as elements active solidarity and just development within nations both rich and poor. Feeding a hungry nation is a notable goal, yet it is still less than the heavenly banquet. Building a peaceful world order is a moral achievement, even if that peace is less than the fullness of peace that only God can give. We do not keep faith with God's call to renew the earth if we cynically dismiss goods that are achievable because they are not perfect. Political peace is not all that believers should seek, but it is a worthy goal for disciples who follow the rabbi who pronounced, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Thank you very much. I think we have time for some questions, comments, rebuttals, uh, whatever you'd like to pose. Uh, the floor is open. Joe Mastardi, how are you, Joe? How are you? Joe and I are classmates, although he looks much older than me, as you may know. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I, it, I mean, I think, you know, I would not dispute for a moment that I think Jesus was nonviolent. In fact, I would push it further. I'd say he was non-resistant, uh, not just nonviolent. He he could have fled from Gethsemane, uh, but he didn't. He allowed himself to be arrested. Right. So uh, clearly, the witness of Jesus is, I think, at least nonviolence, if not non-resistance. Uh, and clearly, the early church understood it that way. Uh, you find no participation of Christians in the military till about 175 A.D. is the first time you see any sign of that. And that usually, and that in all likelihood was people who were in the military because they basically were functioning as police uh, rather than as uh, uh, warriors in the normal sense of the term. Uh, the only way I think one can understand this is as the social location of Christians change, so too one's responsibilities have to be rethought. And let me give you a homey example of this, right? Uh, now I'm going to betray my absolute ignorance of uh, Pennsylvania geography. What's the river here? The Schuylkill? Is that the river? Schuylkill. Schuylkill, okay. You're walking across, you're walking along the Schuylkill River, all right? And all of a sudden, you see someone out in the middle of the river drowning, calling for help, right? Screaming to be saved. You're the only person on the bank of the river. Do you jump in to save the person? Well, what if you can't swim? Do you have an obligation to jump into the river if you can't swim to save that person? Right? Obviously not. You only make the situation worse. Now there's two people drowning, right? What, what 
if you are the captain of the Villanova swim team? What if you could backstroke your way out there and breaststroke your way in without even breaking a sweat? Now do you have an obligation? Yes. In other words, one's moral obligations always have to be fitted to one's resources. You cannot morally oblige people to do things that are impossible. Right? But if people have different resources, they encounter different obligations. Well, what happens, of course, is the early generation of Christians were largely powerless people with no social influence, uh, with no ability to really make a difference within the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire doesn't have elections for Caesar, right? And the Roman Empire doesn't have a police civilian review board for human rights violations, right? They were in charge and they could do as they wish and Christians simply had to deal with that, right? You see that very clearly in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation where the church is enduring persecution and the guidance given to the Christian community is for this the saints must suffer and endure, right? That's all we could do, right? You weren't going to change the Roman Empire and we're told if you take up a sword you will be put, you will die by the sword. Right? There's, there's nothing one can do before the Roman Empire. Right? <clears throat> but in time, Christians move into a different social location. Right? In that location where they had very little social influence, one might say the meaning of loving the neighbor in that setting was first do no harm to the neighbor. Right? The old axiom, primum non notere, first do no harm. Right? If you could assist the neighbor, assist the person with personal intervention. But that's about all one had the ability to do, right? You, 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 you didn't know how to swim and you couldn't save them beyond that, right? In the fourth century, all right, the Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian, right? In the fourth century, toleration is granted the Christian church. It can become an institution. It's capable of establishing itself. Now you have Christians who are not marginal in the life of the Roman Empire. You have Christians who are policy makers in the Roman Empire. You have Christians who are magistrates in cities and towns. You have the emperor who's a Christian. Now you have a different set of resources. Now not only can you not do harm, you have the resources whereby you may be able to do some positive good. Right? You can muster resources in ways that might be able to change the society, bring about more justice in the treatment of people, right? change economic or political policies, because now Christians have a different social location. Well, that makes some sense, okay? What I want to suggest to you is, <clears throat> take the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? and uh, speed it up a little bit. Let's say the Good Samaritan came upon the man who was being beaten, not after he was beaten, and not after the priests and the scribes walked past him. Now let's imagine you come upon the scene while the man is being beaten and attacked. What do you do? Right? Well, now you're living in a situation where you can you can direct the police, in effect, right? You can use some means, and you have the wherewithal to use means, to stop this man's violent aggression against this innocent victim. Now what do you do, right? And what was not so obvious to Christians now at this point was, is the solution always, you know, that we can't use some force to save an innocent third party, right? It doesn't settle it, right? It doesn't settle the argument. The argument's been going on for 2,000 years, right? But the question gets asked in a different setting now, you see. And now the idea that you might be able to use some violent force for a purpose which is judged to be, in fact, a way of loving the neighbor, right, at least becomes debated. 
And I think that's some of the dynamic that's going on there, Mary Catherine, in terms of what's happening. It's clear the early church was very uncomfortable with the shedding of blood, and that continues on throughout. I mean, right up through the Middle Ages, the idea that if someone shed blood, even in a war that was approved by the church, still required penance, all right? It still called upon people sometimes to refrain from the, receiving the sacraments for a period of time. There were, there, was, there were these lurking sensibilities that something's incompatible with bloodshed and the gospel, right? But, it's, but those debates are going on in a much more complex social situation where Christians are in a different social location and so the questions get framed and asked and debated in a somewhat new way. So that's why the question gets transformed. Not necessarily settled, and it still gets debated now, right? But why it happens is because it seems to me we went from being people on the shore who can't swim to people we, we can make a difference and we have the resources and the wherewithal at times to do something. And then the question becomes, well then what should you do? Yes, Jen. Um, I think a lot of conversation kind of goes around the idea of what are the um, ethical responsibilities or shortcomings um, regarding one nation in relationship to another in terms of kind of a tenuous um, question of intervention, peace, um, and like, injustice. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak at all to the relationship um, within one um, nation or body itself between the people making the decisions and the people carrying them out? And is there a sense of the dual nature of seeing both a perpetrator and the victim mm -hmm. um, when you're not in charge of the decisions but you're in charge of carrying them out that gets back mm -hmm. into kind of that consideration? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question, and it's one of the places where, obviously, you know, you, you have real uh, crises of conscience with people. Uh, one of the interesting things, of course, is that the logic, it, it wasn't always recognized by the official church, but the logic of the just war tradition, right, requires one to be able to say that some wars are unjust, right, and therefore, if they are unjust, one ought not have the obligation to fight, right? That one could conscientiously withhold agreement to participate in the war. Now, the truth of the matter is, uh, the church wasn't always consistent in that, right? Because the other thing that was, that that, that kind of always, that sort of, you might say, uh, element of respect for conscience was there, but what was also there was this element of great respect for legitimate authority, right? And there was this tendency to say one needed to defer to one's rulers or leaders who made the decision, and if they determined it was a just war, uh, weren't they in a far more advantageous situation to make that judgment than the average uh, citizen was? And of course, if we take this back into earlier times, when there's broad-based illiteracy, where there's, there's no you know, widespread public education, where you have these sorts of situations, it, 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 there's at least some plausibility there that were people sufficiently and adequately matured morally that they could make conscientious decisions. It was at least debatable, right? But in a society such as ours, look at you, right? Uh, you know, you have more information inside those cell phones you carry around with you, right, than most medieval scholars had in their libraries, you know? When you have that kind of access to information, when you've had the kind of training and uh, experiences that people like yourselves have had, when you live in a country that sees itself as essentially democratic, right, and wants to see active citizenship and participation in the organs of government, again, it transforms the question, right? And I think it brings it, you know, to a much finer point. And so I think today what you find is, you know, uh, I mean, I mean let, let me put it this way. <clears throat> does anyone think, does anyone think we would have had the same policies in Iraq and Afghanistan if we had a general draft rather than a volunteer army? No. Right? The citizenry of the country just would not have stood for it. Right? Uh, most of you, if you were all subject to the draft upon graduation, you would have been doing the same sorts of things that that radical Mastati was doing back in the 60s, all right, over the Vietnam War. In other words, 
again, you know, some of this stuff is, it doesn't quite create the moral urgency for some of us because we see ourselves as in some ways uh, exempted from the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the way this thing cashes out. But if there was real engagement of the wider citizenry in this war, I think you would have found far more resistance to Afghanistan and Iraq than what we have now, in which, you know, uh, because, it's a, because it's a volunteer army, there's a willingness of a lot of people just to sort of stand on the sidelines and say, well, not my battle. And quite literally, it's not, it becomes that, not my fight, you know.